Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture on causal inference methods. In this lecture we are going to go through some of the common methods which are used in the program evaluation literature. It is um, linked to the machine learning literature in the sense that uh, lately, there has been a lot of improvements in, um, in at the frontier between those two disciplines, so that now machine learning algorithms are being used um, in order to assess the impact of some uh, policies on um, some given outcomes. So, economists are often interested in the impact of a policy on a given outcome, and might want to identify its impact before implementing it. It is pretty much the same way pharmaceutical companies conduct trials before selling a drug, or medical doctors test treatments on a sample of patients. They want to look at different treatments, exposure to a certain drug, or um, maybe spacing some analysis um, over time, or um, any other kind of treatment and they want to, have to uh, assess the impact of those drugs on um, some specific health outcomes. That could be something like cholesterol, um, cardiac measures, um, and so on. Some individuals might be subject to the policy, which in this lecture we are going to call the treatment, and others not. Individuals can differ across various characteristics, could be a different age, uh, different ethnicity, different background, and so on and so forth. The question is then how to estimate the pure effect of the policy. It is particularly relevant in economics because those policies are usually um, expensive. They come at costs. There are things such as the impact of a minimum wage on um, labor market outcomes such as employment, uh, number of hours worked on average, and so on and so forth. Or it could be in education programs. Does um, the access to some resources um, for some kids affect their academic record? Maybe not. Um, how does um, subsidizing a family in order to, uh, for them to buy um, school resources, school material for their kids, how does that affect their academic performances, performances, and so on. We want to make sure that the difference in the outcome variable is not due to some particular characteristics of the treated individuals. We want to make sure that the difference we observe between the ones who are treated and the ones who are not treated is only due to the policy. We want to assess the impact of the policy. We want to make sure that somebody is not doing better thanks to um, that somebody is not doing better thanks to something which is different from a drug. It could be that this person has maybe some genes in particular that make that make him more um, resilient, or it could be that um, his age was different from other um, individuals, and so maybe because he's young he can recover faster. So we want to make sure that the effect we estimate is only due to the drug and not to any other characteristics. So, the outline for this lecture. First, I'm going to talk about the treatment effects taxonomy. I'm going to talk about the different terms, uh, the corresponding definitions, and I want to give you a warning. The notation is going to get heavy, okay? I will try to go as slow as possible, but the notation is going to get heavy and very wordy and mathematical at the same time. You'll see. Then I'll get into how to estimate average treatment effects. What are the assumptions we need to make to make sure that we are targeting the right effect? Then I'll get into other types of estimators that can be used if some assumptions are not satisfied, but maybe others are. The difference in differences estimator in particular will be um, um, particularly useful. Then I'll get into what we call regression discontinuity design, where, again, the setup of the experiment could be different, and because it is different, then we will have to use different 
methods to estimate the treatment effect. Finally, I will talk about synthetic control methods, a rather recent, maybe the most, yeah, it is the most recent methods out of the ones um, I will talk about. Um, it is very deep, uh, very relevant, and um, yeah, we'll talk about this. Most of the papers you guys have to read for the presentations will involve estimators that we go over today. So I strongly recommend you to um, be focused on this lecture and to look at it later. A lot of the things that I'm going to talk about will be in the papers and uh, they will be relevant for you to know in the future as well. For this uh, lecture, I suggest you to read chapter 4, 6, 7, 9 and 10 in uh, Causal Inference the Mixtape by Scott Cunningham. You can also take a look at mostly harmless econometrics. Uh, but personally, I preferred reading those chapters from Causal Inference and I borrowed um, notation heavily from that book. Okay. Let's start with the taxonomy. Definitions, assumptions, and the baseline estimation. First of all, we are going to consider a binary variable that we are going to call D, that equals one if Mr. I is subject to the treatment and zero if he is not. We are interested in the impact of the treatment, so the effect of D on an outcome variable Y. Individuals which are subject to the treatment are part of the treatment group and individuals who are not are part of the control group. And I will uh, use those words a lot. Treated unit, treated treatment group, control group, control units. Okay? Or you can also call the control group the untreated group. But typically we call this the control group um, in economics. Now, things are going to get a bit abstract. We are going to talk about potential outcomes. Individual I has two potential outcomes. Yi1 and Yi0. So, Yi1 is the value of the outcome if Mr. I gets treated. And Yi0 is the value of Y if Mr. I doesn't get treated. In real life, if I have a data set and I treat some people but not others, we need a bit of both, then I will, for Mr. I, I will only observe either Yi1 if Mr. I is treated or I will observe Yi0 if he is not treated. So I will never observe both at the same time, right? This is why things are going to get a bit abstract. What we observe is called the actual world, the real world, okay? What we do not observe is the counterfactual world. The word counterfactual is used a lot. Every time you hear counterfactual in economics and econometrics, you have to think about what if. Counterfactual means what would happen if. So, if for instance, Mr. I is treated, Yi1 will be the actual outcome, something I can observe in my data, and Yi0 is the counterfactual outcome what the outcome would be if Mr. I, Mr. I had not been treated. The whole game in the program evaluation literature is to assess, to estimate the difference, the average difference between those two outcomes. Problem is, we only observe one. For each individual I, define the unit-specific treatment effect, delta I, which is the difference between what the outcome is if, if he is treated and what the, out, what the outcome is if he is not treated. 
There we go. Let's get into some definitions. The average treatment effect, or tau ATE, is defined as the expectation of the outcome variable if people are treated, minus the expectation of the outcome variable if people are not treated. It is the average difference, or the difference in the average um, outcomes between treated and not treated. Now, the average treatment effect on the treated is a more um, tangible concept, which, which relates to what we are going to observe in the data. ATT is going to be the average outcome of individuals who are treated. This is why I put given DI is equal to 1 if they are treated, okay, minus the average outcome of my people who are treated if they had not been treated. This effect means that I am looking at people who got treated only. And people who got treated, I want to look at the average difference between if they have been treated versus if they had not been. Since I am looking at the ones who have been treated, I can observe this, this I can see it, because the outcome I see for the treated people is Y1. However, since they are treated, I do not know what the outcome would have been if they had not been treated. So again, here I observe one, I am able to observe one, and take a sample average, but I do definitely do not observe that one. The same way I was looking at the treated people, I can look at the effect on the untreated people. The effect of the treatment on the untreated people means that I am looking at the untreated ones, which is why di is equal to zero in both. And I look at the difference in the average outcome if they had been treated versus if they had not been treated. Because they are the untreated people, I observe this one because they have not been treated, but I do not observe this one. Again, I am missing a uh, component. The objective, though, is to estimate one or several of these effects. The ATT is the average treatment effect on the group that was assigned the treatment. The group who got the pill, if you like. We cannot compute the ATE, ATT, or ATU, as we only observe one outcome. We do not observe the counterfactual. By definition, counterfactual is something we do not observe. It is what would happen in a parallel world. Have you guys watched The Matrix? At some point, Morpheus proposes a blue pill and a red pill to Neo. He gives him two different scenarios, and Neo ends up taking, I believe, I forgot which pill, but he takes a pill. The counterfactual world is pretty much what the movie would have been if he had taken the other pill. And the other pill was, you, uh, you stay in your life being controlled by machines, and so on and so forth. That would be pretty much... What the, it would be pretty much the world we are living in. However, we can estimate them. And I'll show you under which conditions. Depending on the question, one or all the parameters are of interest. The most common ones are ATE and ATT. In fact, I will not even talk about ATU in uh, this lecture.
Any questions so far? This notation should be on lock to be able to follow the rest of the lecture. We're going to have a bunch of yi's with a one given di and so on and so forth. And you probably noticed by now that every time I give, I talk about an expectation, I have to be careful about what I say. This is the average outcome of the treated people if they had not been treated. It's as if I had to make six or seven words for each subscript or upper script that I see in one expectation. So it's notation heavy and word heavy. Okay, so let's start with the treatment effect decomposition. Imagine that in my sample, I have pi percent of the people that are getting the treatment. It could be 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, doesn't matter. What we observe, what we are able to observe from our sample is a sample analog of these expectations. The, I can compute the average outcome of people who got treated. Since they got treated, what I observe about them is Y1. I can also compute the average outcome for the non-treated people if they had not been treated. Because again, they haven't, been they haven't been treated. So this is what I observe about them. The Y I observe from them is Y0. So this is what I am able to observe. But is that a good measure, a consistent, an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect? It turns out that this difference can be decomposed into three terms. The first one is the actual average treatment effect with yi here and yi here. This notation is the same as this notation. But then you can see that there's a difference here. There's a difference with the one here and the zero. Here, we do not have them. The idea is that yi is either y1 or y0. But in my here you can see that I do not have the one and the zero anymore. And that's because I have two more terms coming next. The second term is what we call a selection bias. It is the average outcome for the treated people if they had not been treated. And minus the average outcome for the untreated people if they had not been treated. Well, since we have a zero here and a zero here, this we observe. All the untreated people, the outcome I observe from them is indeed Y0. However, for the non-treated people, for the, sorry, for the treated people, what I observe is not Y0, it's Y1. So I do not observe the first component here. Finally, the third uh, term that we observe is going to be a heterogeneous treatment effect bias. It is equal to 1 minus pi, the share of people who did not get a treatment, times the difference between the average treatment effect on the treated and the average treatment effect on the untreated. You can take a look at the um, causal inference, the mixtape, for a decomposition of this into these three terms. It is long, but not very complicated. It consists in doing a bunch of plus and minuses. Make sure that the notation is uh, respected. It gets confusing very quickly. And then rearrange terms everywhere. So what we observe is composed of what we would like to estimate plus two terms that are not zero, 
which we would like to get rid of. The selection bias in particular is very, very uh, important. It is the difference in average outcomes between treated and untreated if none of them had been treated. So, in real life, we have the treated and the non-treated. The selection bias is the difference between the treated and the non-treated if none of them had been treated. We call this a selection bias because if it is not zero, it means that for some reason, the average treatment, the average, uh, sorry, the average outcome of the untreated group is not the same as the average outcome of the treated group. If none of them had been treated, this means that imagine there is no treatment or before getting into any uh, treatment assignment, the treated group, the group that is going to be treated would do differently than the non-treated group if they had not been treated. It means that there is something among the treated group or among the non-treated group that makes them have a different outcome in the absence of a treatment. Typically this happens if I choose who gets the treatment in a specific way. If I choose, for instance, to give a pill to everybody who's um, younger than 30 years old among my patients, and everybody else doesn't get the pill, or they get a placebo. Well, I might observe a difference, but the difference might not only due to the pill, it might also be due to the fact that the treated people are younger and being younger, they are more resilient, their body is more active, their immune system is stronger and so on. In this case, I would not be able to isolate the pure effect of the pill. I would, my, my estimation would be contaminated with the fact that in the first place, I selected a specific um, group according to a specific characteristic which, in the absence of treatment, would have done differently than the other group anyway. If I, need, if I give, let's say, a placebo to everybody, but to the younger ones I give a blue pill, and to the older ones I give a red pill, but the pill is exactly the same, it's a placebo, there is nothing in it. Which means, there is no treatment. Well, the average outcome is likely to be different for the younger ones who got a specific pill and who got like the blue pill, I think I said, and the older ones who got the red pill. But this is not due to the pill. This is due to the fact that they are younger. So this is why we call this a selection bias, because this group, the treated group or the untreated group, the control group, was selected in the first place. The last effect is also important. It is the difference between the effect of the treatment on the treated versus on the untreated. Again, if the treatment affects the treated and the untreated differently, then that means that this difference will be equal it would not be equal to zero. But those two effects are biases. They are going to contaminate my estimation. They will prevent me from detecting the pure effect of the treatment. How can we get rid of them? So in words, 
those are the three uh, things we observe. But not separately. That's the thing. We observe them all together. We cannot disentangle them because, again, some of these numbers cannot be observed because they correspond to counterfactual outcomes. The latter two effects are a problem. They are not due to the treatment itself. They are due to inherent characteristics, which are different across groups. Since we cannot absorb them, observe them, we cannot sub subtract, subtract them to get an estimate of the average treatment effect. Now, in order to be able to get rid of these biases, we are going to need to make some assumptions. The first assumption is called Stable Unit Treatment Value Assumption, SUDVA. It says the following, potential outcomes of one individual are not affected by the treatment status of any other individual. In words, there are no spillover effects. The fact that I get the treatment will have no impact on your situation, whether you are treated or not. Okay? A case where this assumption would be violated would be to look at, let's say, a brother and a sister and treat the brother to give, the, give a specific treatment to the brother, but at home, there could be a way for the brother to um, maybe share some of his treatment to his sister. There will be a spillover effect, and now my control unit, the sister, would be contaminated by the treatment. Not contaminated by a disease, just it will be affected, her outcome would be affected by the treatment of her brother without her receiving the treatment in the first place. An example, imagine that we, the treatment is, we um, give a laptop to the brother and we want to see if he's going to do better at school having a laptop at home to work with. The sister is not getting a laptop and we look at her as a control group, as somebody to compare her brother to. Problem is at home, we cannot control the fact that the sister might also benefit from the, the brother's laptop. Maybe she can borrow it for a bit if she has a project or an, an, or an exam or something. Although she's not supposed to be treated, she will be affected by the treatment. And as a consequence, her outcome will be, her grade, will be contaminated by the treatment, although we did not want her to be treated in the first place. So here we talk about the potential outcomes of one individual are not affected by the treatment status. The second assumption we're going to make is, is a bit tricky, so bear with me. It says that the potential outcomes yi0 and yi1 are independent of the treatment. So the treatment assignment who gets the treatment and who doesn't is independent of what could potentially happen to Mr. I. Whether I treat Mr. I or not, whether I decide to treat him or not, is independent of what could happen in each case. What it means is that the treatment was not given to this person based on what could happen if they were treated or not. As a doctor, imagine, if I know that one of my patients is going to do better thanks to a drug and I decide to give him the drug, then what I will observe at the end of the day is not just the effect of the drug, is the fact that my patient was likely to do better with it. Because maybe, maybe my patient 
has something in him. It could be a gene, it could be the age, it could be some uh, characteristics regarding pulse, blood flow, cholesterol, that makes him more susceptible to react well to the drug. In this case, of course, I might see a good result if, if my belief is true that it's going to do well and it does well. Then I might say, it's due to the drug. No, it's not only due to the drug. It's due to him taking the drug well. So independence means that who I give the treatment to doesn't depend on how I think they would react to the treatment or not. It means that nobody got selected into the treatment or the control group based on what could, ha what could happen. And again, you can see that every time I say what could happen based on a counterfactual. The example I just gave is give a drug to someone knowing it will benefit them versus another violates independence because I know that if he had been treated why I won will be his outcome would be better um, with the drug than for another observation than for another um, patient another unit and this other variable what makes this person react well to the treatment is what we usually call a confounder. In fact, confounder in French means to mix up. For instance, if I mix up the names of two people, I'm going to say, oh, I confound. That's the French term, the French verb. I would say I confound their names because I mix them up. Here, this is the same thing. This other variable would make us believe that the treatment has a good effect Whereas, in fact, the effect is not due to the drug, it's due to something else. So the treatment must be assigned ignoring or choosing not, yeah, ignoring or choosing to ignore how each individual would respond. This guarantees pretty much that observations across the treatment group and the control group are comparable. I can look at the average outcome of the treated versus the average outcome of the non-treated because I know that there is no fundamental difference between the two groups that would um, amplify or maybe diminish the effect of the treatment. In technical terms, the independence assumption means the following. It means that for the treated units, the average outcome is the same as the average outcome of the non-treated units if both units had been treated. If everybody had been treated, the difference in the average outcome would be equal to zero. The average outcome would be the same. And this is the same for, <coughs> for the difference between treated and non-treated if nobody had been treated. In words, the average potential outcomes, y1, y0, are the same for either the treatment or the control. groups. The average outcome had units been treated is the same when looking at the treatment group versus the control group. That's for the first one. And the second one is the average outcome had units not been treated is the same when looking at treatment versus control. Assumption 2 implies, so this mathematical uh, assumption, you can take a look at it and uh, apply it to the selection bias and the heterogeneous treatment effect bias. 
And you would find that because of this assumption, now both biases disappear. So if this assumption is satisfied, then what I observe, the difference between the treated units and the non-treated units is guaranteed to give me an estimate of the average treatment effect. How can I satisfy assumption two? Any idea? So I need to make sure that <clears throat> who gets the treatment doesn't depend on what could happen to them. So I need to make sure that if I am the one deciding who gets the treatment, I have to make sure that I don't let my own judgment bias me by deciding to give the treatment to this one instead of that one. And indeed, the answer is in the chat, randomize. If you randomize the way you assign the treatment, you're going to have some old in the treatment, some old in the control, some young in the treatment, some young in the control, and so on and so forth. Both groups will be comparable because if none of them were treated, the average outcome would be the same. And if both of them had been treated, the average outcome would also be the same. This way, I am removing the selection bias. I am removing the effect of the treatment that could be due not to the treatment itself, but due to the fact that that group, for some reason, has better characteristics than the other, or different characteristics. This is why, when you have clinical trials, they're usually a system of randomization in order to um, not let treatment assignment bias your results. In fact, in the case of clinical trials, they even use a double randomization method. Even the doctor himself doesn't know who got the placebo and who got the actual treatment pill. The idea of double uh, randomization is to also make sure the doctor is not biased in his way he's going to treat his patients, knowing that this one got the placebo, but this one didn't. This way, the doctor is just looking at some data, but doesn't know if the data is looking at is the data of somebody who got the placebo or not until he uh, is going to start the analysis. So, if assumption 1 and 2 are satisfied, we can use linear regression tools and estimate the following model. You regress y, the outcome, on an intercept, beta 0, plus the treatment. What's going to happen in this case is, if I take the expectation of y given that the treatment is equal to 1, so I look at the average outcome of my treated individuals minus the average outcome of my non-treated individuals, if you just do the math, the difference will be beta 0 plus tau minus beta 0. The beta zeros are going to cancel out and you're left with tau, the average treatment effect. In fact, you don't even need to use linear regression tools. You could just look at the difference in the outcome of the treated and the outcome of the non-treated, which is something that many um, people do in the medical field in particular. They don't necessarily use regressions. They simply, as long as um, randomization of the treatment happens, they just look at the average outcome of the ones who got the pill minus the average outcome of the ones who got the placebo. So, tau hat will estimate the average treatment effect. Now, since we use a linear regression, we need to make sure that at least 
the first four assumptions of uh, the OLS estimator are satisfied. We'll still need epsilon to be equal to zero on average, conditional on x. We need to make sure uh, all these things are satisfied, plus assumption one, sudva, and two, independence. And this will estimate our average treatment effect. Then, since you are using a linear regression, you can use standard hypothesis testing to look at the significance of tau. You get the standard errors. You usually you use your um, hypothesis test the usual way, and you are, and you can test whether the treatment has a significant effect or not. In practice. You can also throw a bunch of x's, which is the advantage of using a linear regression versus just taking the difference in means. We can add covariates, control for age, income, ethnicity, gender, any other covariates. They need to satisfy the OLS assumption. And that can increase the precision of the estimates via a lower residual variance. Remember that the residual variance, the variance of the residuals, is used in the formula for the standard errors. The more variables I throw in the regression, remember, the higher my R squared, which means the lower the variance of the residuals. Again, we do not want to get into overfitting, but controlling for a couple of covariates can also um, give us additional treatment effects. We could look at the treatment effect just not on people who got a treatment versus people who didn't, but we could look at the average outcome for treated people between 20 and 30 years old and the average outcome for untreated people between 20 and 30 years old. So we can narrow down the um, treatment effect because the treatment effect could be different for somebody who's 25 than for somebody who's 45. We call this heterogeneous treatment effect. Let's look at how it looks like in our studio. So I generated data, I generated potential outcomes, and I generated a rule to, to determine who's going to get assigned the treatment or not. Who's going to get a 1, who's going to get a 0. But the rule to assign who gets a 1 or a 0 here was based on the potential outcome. So I gave a 1 to all the potential outcomes that were bigger than a certain value. As if I was a doctor thinking, oh, I think these patients would react to the drug better because of some characteristic. The true effect is equal to 2. Tau here is equal to 2. Note that if I regress y on the intercept, the, my rule d pot for potential and x, the estimated effect is 1.23 pretty far from 2. This is due to the fact that I chose, I selected the treatment group according to what could have, what could have happened to them if they were treated. If on the other hand I randomly assign treatment, which I call D, then you can see the estimate is equal to 2.04, the real number tau being equal to The difference here is that this estimation is contaminated by a selection bias and a heterogeneous treatment effect bias, whereas this one abstracts from both of these biases so that the only thing left is the actual treatment effect. Note that following this variable, I can have the standard error, 
the T statistic and the P value to get three stars. Three stars means that I reject the null hypothesis that the average treatment effect is equal to zero. I made the treatment effect equal to two. And here, this regression is confirming that it is uh, indeed not equal to zero. So the effect is significant. This is typically the kind of conclusion that economists would make after running a randomized control trial. And if they show that the impact is positive or negative, they can make policy recommendations. Typically, a trial consists in testing the policy on a sample. If, after doing the regressions, we find evidence that the policy has an impact, good or bad, then we can make policy recommendations and say, yes, it might be expensive to do, to implement at the population level, but it has a positive impact. So we should implement it. If, on the other hand, it doesn't have any impact, then you give up. You say, well, we thought there could be, there could be an impact, but it seems there isn't. So no need to invest massive amounts of money to implement the, um, the policy on a national scale. So, to be able to estimate the average treatment effect consistently and without any bias, assumptions 1 and 2 need to hold. We can achieve that by carefully designing experiments so that treatment is independent of potential outcomes and other confounders. So, do not assign treatment um, based on a um, characteristic that you observe or that you believe is different for one individual versus others. And the treatment doesn't create spillovers, the brother and sister example. In practice, it requires careful preparation and financial investments. Once everything is controlled for, however, the regression is very easy to implement. So a lot of the work when conducting RCTs is the background checks, is the preparation. Make sure the treatment is correctly assigned, as in randomly assigned. Make sure there are no spillover effects, depending on the nature of the treatment. In the case of giving a laptop to a kid, it's possible there are spillover effects, at least with his friends and his family. But if we are talking about a pill for a medical trial, then likely um, once the patient takes his pill, it won't have any impact on any other patient. Results are easy to obtain and strongly reliable, as long as these assumptions are satisfied. So there's a lot of work in the preparation of an RCT, but once the data is there, things are rather straightforward. There could be also other checks in the background regarding hypothesis testing. This is not something I want to get into today, but something you might encounter in the papers you're going to have to present. RCTs in uh, the economic literature include education programs, give some kids access to some resources, uh, there had been a paper recently by a former student from SFU where they gave access to um, Wikipedia to some students in Malawi. Malawi is a poor country that doesn't have internet everywhere. They gave access to Wikipedia uh, something like one hour a day for some kids in some schools and looked at the impact on their academic performance after, I don't remember, one semester or a whole year of um, of courses. It could be financial or in-kind help. A recent graduate from SFU, Ricardo Melman Lomascon, um, conducted a trial in Mexico where 
they gave um, they they gave uh, financial aid to some families to see how that would um, how that would impact the performances of the kids at school. They also gave another treatment to other families where instead of giving financial aid, they gave in-kind help in the form, I believe, of um, healthy foods and maybe some resources like notebooks, pens, and so on. And they want to, and they compared the impact of these um, treatments on, um, they compared that with kids who did not get any treatment and look at the difference in their academic achievement resulting from the treatment. It is used a lot in development programs. The most recent French um, Nobel Prize laureate in economics is called Esther Duflo. She is rather young, I think she's 55. She works at MIT and she, among other things, won the Nobel Prize for her contribution in um, program evaluation in development, where, among other things, she um, designed an experiment where she gave access to mosquito nets to some families in um, some African countries. I don't remember which ones. And looked at the impact on the, um, on the frequency of paludism cases. Paludism is a disease that can be transmitted from mosquito bites. So having mosquito nets would likely protect uh, people from getting um, bitten by mosquitoes, which should reduce the occurrence of paludism. She has a lot of other um, papers and uh, programs designed to um, designed towards developing countries. I really suggest you to look at her um, personal page online. She has very, very interesting work. But that also applies to give access to clean water, sanitary equipment, and so on, and look at the impact uh, of just these resources on health outcomes. And there are many more. Those experiments are used a lot in um, education programs and development programs, but they are also used in other areas of economics. Okay, I'd say it's a good time to have a small break. Let's have a 10 minute break and let's resume at 3.35. I suggest you to um, take a breather and make sure that you understand um, all the things I talked about, that you're not too confused by the notation because we're gonna keep using this heavy notation for the rest of the lecture. See you in 10 minutes.
Why? Oh, people don't want to be compared to other people. Oh, boo-hoo, I'm not as fast as you. You don't think people are already comparing when you're in gym class and you're playing tag and you know your friend tags you every time? You don't think you already know they're faster than you? Or when you arm wrestled your friend in recess, you know they're stronger. Or when you do a test and you have a higher grade or you don't understand something, we're comparing ourselves to people all the time. But rather than say, I don't like being compared because I'm not as good. Do better. Practice harder. Harder than last time. Use it as motivation to inspire you to do more. That's what it did for me. And look at the career path it set me on. So when I watch this Try Guys video, it's probably not the way you watch it. You're making fun, oh, they're not stronger than fifth graders. I watch it and think, why doesn't that motivate you to do better and practice and be the best that you can be? And does it look like they're not happy? They're celebrating and cheering each other on on every single event. That is what I like to see. That is why I like this video so much. They're pumped, they're motivated, and they're inspired. And who knows, after this fitness test, maybe they're going to start running more, walking faster, doing push-ups and sit-ups and improving. That is what it can do for the children. So is it bad to compare people? Well, it's bad if you compare yourself to other people and you get down on yourself and you say, oh, I suck because I'm not as good as them. You look on Instagram and you see the Gymshark athletes with the shredded abs, you're like, oh, I don't look as good as them. Or... You can look at the Gymshark athletes who are shredded and say, I might not look like them, but I'm 50 pounds overweight. I can lose 10. I could do a bit better. I could eat a bit healthier. Now, I'm not going to use PDs, but I'm going to do better and be healthier. What is wrong with that? 22 in a row. In a row. In a row. Oh. <laughs> no part of elementary school before that was like, oh, conditioning to prepare you for that. You were just supposed to develop elementary school. 22 in a row. In a row. In a row. <laughs> no part of elementary school before that was like, oh, conditioning to prepare you for that. You were just supposed to develop this strength somehow. And he's complaining that they didn't specifically practice for this. So what? When you do your SATs or you do an IQ test, you have to specifically practice for everything. You go to school and you learn and you try to get smart. And you do a test. If you don't do good, it's not good. If you fail at push-ups... Maybe practice doing push-ups. If you are not flexible and you're bad, rather than saying, oh, but it's genetics. I suck at flexibility. It's my genetics. Yeah, it probably is. Doesn't mean you can't stretch. Doesn't mean you can't do that sit and reach test and reach another inch. Keep practicing. Keep going at your flexibility. This lets you know what are you good at and what are you bad at. You got it. This lets Let's you, know, you got excellent on the push-ups and sit-ups. That's great. You fail the run. Maybe work on your cardio. When I was a kid, I did amazing on the push-ups, had the school record for push-ups, had the school record for push-ups, the shuttle run, the long jump, was great at those events. Had no cardio. Bad cardiovascular endurance. Was not made to do triathlons, to bike race, to run. Was super strong. Strongest kid in the class, strongest kid in the school. Had amazing genetics for strength. Shit genetics for cardio. Twin brother. Shit genetics for cardio. And guess what? Competes in 10K runs. Why? Because he practiced. He worked on it. He didn't get lazy. He did the best he could do. And is he a champion runner? No. Is he good? Yeah, he's good. He's not amazing, but he's good. If you don't have the best genetics, you had asthma, you're born with the worst genetics, practice and do better. Doesn't mean because you practice, you're going to achieve elite level standards in powerlifting. Oh, everyone can bench press 300 pounds, squat 400, deadlift 500. If they just practice, everyone can do it. No, of course they can't. Are you crazy? Not everyone has the genetics to be amazing, but you can be better, better than you are. And isn't that what's important? Being the best you can be. Not a, you think all the try guys can all bench 300 and squat 400 pounds just if they practice properly? No, not everyone can bench press 300. Does that mean he can't work his ass off and try to bench 260? 
There's nothing wrong with practicing and doing the best you can do, even if it means you can't bench 300. So what? Maybe your genetics are, you can only bench 200. What is wrong with that? And it shouldn't unmotivate you for me to say that not everyone has amazing genetics. Not everyone can bench press 300 pounds. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is you do the best that you can do and improve. The way that, that fitness was approached in my school all throughout my childhood, it was all a ranking system. And I was judged against not myself, but other people. And that made me feel really bad about myself. <laughs> I was short and I compared myself to other people who are taller than me. So what? I was shorter. Just because I'm shorter, that doesn't make me a bad person. Oh, I'm a madlet. Who freaking gives a shit? Compare yourself to other people. Yeah, they're all faster than me. So what? Why does it matter? What's next? You go to the beach, you compare yourself. Oh, everyone is leaner than me. Does that mean you don't lose weight? Does that mean you don't go to the beach, that you can't go on a diet and eat healthier? What is wrong with comparing yourself to other people if it all it does is motivate you to do more? Do that. We did it! Yeah! Yeah! Woo! Not everyone needs to get a first place prize. Society has become a bunch of pussies. Everyone needs a participation trophy. You show up and you win. And if you're compared to someone else and you don't win, that's somehow a bad thing. Builds character, people. Builds character. Nowadays in the world, everyone thinks they need to be a champion. Listen, to be a champion, you should have to work for it. Shouldn't just be handed to you on a silver platter. And if you get the silver platter, you can complain because it wasn't gold. Oh, I don't want to do the beep test because you have to run and So, how is everything so far? It is the first time for me <clears throat> teaching this as well, so let me know if um, I'm not very clear, let me know if I am confusing. I'm trying to be as clear as possible, but I, I know myself that when I learned this for the first time, it was very, very confusing and it took me many, many times uh, until I understood what was going on. I had to read things over and over again. I had to read different textbooks because some of them give you a certain exposition, but with a certain wording. Others, a different exposition with different wording. And since English is not my first language either, I would find some expositions pretty um, complicated to understand as opposed to others. So I would just stick to whatever explanation works for me, like whatever I could understand. And then I would, um, then I would, this is the textbook I would just stick to when it comes to um, program evaluation. Okay. Let's keep going with difference in differences methods. Many random experiments are impractical, unfeasible, and maybe even unethical. Think about detecting the sources of a disease. You don't know if the disease is airborne, if, it transmit, if it's transmitted through um, physical contact, through fluids, and so on. Would you make patients ingest a potentially infected compound? This right now, at least as things are right now, is uh, not ethically allowed, okay? Then, what if assumption two is not satisfied? What if, for some reason, the treatment will be assigned to people, but not randomly, so that people who get the treatment are fundamentally different from, um, from people who don't get the treatment? Then, the estimation we saw above will not be valid. What we can do is rely on natural experiments, variations in some treatment that affects only some individuals over time and that occur naturally. And by naturally, I mean it could be just um, the government decides to pass a law, um, it could be a new rule, it could be a tax in one area but not in another. Those things are natural in the sense that we are not the ones 
who programmed that um, treatment assignment. However, estimating the difference between the treatment group and the control group after the treatment happened will be biased because groups are fundamentally different. We are going to have a selection bias here. The idea is that when you have such measures, people who are exposed to the treatment might have chosen to be exposed to the treatment in the first place. Especially when it comes to a law or a policy, usually those laws are announced beforehand. Something like from next year on, uh, this um, program, this public policy will be implemented. And then in the meantime, people might have time to adjust maybe move out to an area that is not exposed to the policy or maybe just stay because they're okay with it. So the baseline setup is pretty much the same as before. We have two groups. The treatment group gets D is equal to one. The control group gets D is equal to zero. Now we are going to distinguish two time periods before the treatment and after the treatment. The treatment group is treated between the two time periods and the control group is never treated. So now we're going to add a new dimension to our problem, the time dimension. We have untreated and treated, and then we have untreated before, untreated after, treated before, treated after. So now we are dealing with four different types of expectations. We need to assume that assumption one is still satisfied. No spillovers onto, uh, of the treatment onto somebody who did not get the treatment, for instance. If groups are different ex ante, again, if you look at the difference in average outcomes, we are going to include the effect of the treatment but there will be other components that may have made groups evolve differently even without any treatment because the groups are different in the first place. Here, in this case, what we are interested in is estimating the average treatment on the treated. The main assumption of this method is called parallel trends. And this is the following. The difference in average outcomes between among the treated after versus before, if they had not been treated, is the same as the difference in outcomes for the control group, the non-treated, after versus before, if they had not been treated either. So the idea here is that in the absence of the treatment, both groups would have evolved the same way. The difference in their own outcomes over time would be the same. if no treatment happened. This one is very important as well. Let's talk about it in words. The difference we observe between before and after for the control group, that would be the second part, that's the second difference, is the same as for the treatment group if the treatment group had not been subject to the treatment. Remember that we do not observe these, we do not observe this, and we observe this in the sense that since it is before the treatment happened, we do observe it, but we do not observe the first part. And after the equality, we observe both numbers because everything is in the absence of a treatment. So 
when I look at y upper script 0, as long as I look at the control group, then I observe their outcomes. But I cannot observe the outcome of the treatment group if they had not been treated. That's a counterfactual. If this assumption is not satisfied, then the estimate of the effect of the treatment is not isolated. It will include a group-specific variation over time. It will include the fact that the groups are evolving differently over time, even if there was no treatment. Because a picture is worth 1,000 words, apparently, we're going to take a look at a picture that summarizes that assumption. It is impossible to verify because it includes some counterfactual, but we can show evidence for or against um, that assumption. We can check the trends between the groups before the treatment happens. Here, for simplicity, I look at two time periods, zero and one, but sometimes you can look at multiple periods before and multiple periods after. If the two groups before the treatment seem to evolve in the same way, then it means that they are comparable. In the absence of treatment, they look comparable. And the only thing that is going to change is that one of them, so they are parallel, one of them is going to get the treatment and maybe is going to shoot off or maybe go the other way around. A picture is better. The control group here is in red. The treatment group here is in blue. On the x-axis we have time, we have before the treatment, then the treatment happens, and then we observe the outcome after the treatment. What we observe for the control group is before and after. It seems that it seems that the outcome increased for the control group, but the control group was not um, treated. So that's just a consequence of a variation over time. Now, the treatment group has a sharper increase. If you look at the data after, which is here, and the data before, then you can see that the gap is bigger than for the control group. Now, if we assume parallel trends, it means that in the absence of a treatment, the treatment group would have evolved the same way as the control group. And this is what this dashed line here represents. If there was no treatment, the treatment group would have followed the same pattern as the control group. Note that at the beginning, they are different. Their expectations, their average outcome is different in the first place because they have not been chosen randomly. But if they evolve in the same way, then the difference between the two after is the same as the difference between the two before the treatment. So, if we observe something different, like this thing, this is what we observe for the treatment group, the difference between what we observe and what would have happened without the treatment is the effect of the treatment on the treated. This, ultimately, is what we want to estimate. Now, we do not observe this guy. This guy is the counterfactual. This is expectation of yi0 given d is equal to 1, t is equal to 1. This point here is equal to this point here. It's the average outcome for the treatment group after the treatment if no treatment had 
happen to them. So what can we do? Well, from the graph above, we can actually guess how to estimate the ATT in two steps. First of all, you take the difference between before and after for each group. So you do tr the treatment group after minus before and the control group after minus before. If there was no treatment and under parallel trends, that difference is the same for both groups. But since the treated group got treated, there is something on top, ATT. Then, once you have those two differences, you're going to take the difference of the differences. Hence the name, difference in differences. Since the difference for the treated group is ATT plus A, A being the parallel trend evolution, this is the evolution over time, that would have happened to both groups if nobody had been treated, but the treated group, the treatment group, got ATT on top of it. So when you take the difference, you end up doing ATT plus A coming from the treatment group minus A, which is the evolution of the control group. When you do one minus the other, the A's are going to cancel out. And so that second difference will give you ATT. So the first differences remove the fundamental difference between the treated and the control group before treatment. So the first differences remove the fact that those two dots are not uh, at the same place um, before and after the treatment. The groups are fundamentally different. So if I take a difference of me today and a difference and the difference between me today and me yesterday, I am removing the fact that it is me. Which is why we do treatment after minus treatment before. And on the other side, on the other hand, control after minus control before. We are removing the, the uh, inherent natural distance between the two groups. This versus that. Now that we removed the group specific difference, we need to remove the time difference. Both groups evolved over time and we assume that they would have evolved the same way if treatment had not happened at all. By removing this time difference, then the only thing that remained is the fact that the treated group got treated, so the average treatment effect on the treated. The second difference removes the time variation component. And it is just a difference in means. So it's, re it's really just figuring out which one, which mean to take, then which difference to take, and that's it. Since it's a difference in means, we can also conduct hypothesis testing on means. It is a fairly straightforward concept. This is something you probably know from 200 level courses, in fact, some from business 232 or the courses like that. So this is how it looks like on a picture. As before, this chunk is the ATT. Now, with the parallel trends, this difference is the same as this difference, which is A. This is the time difference. Each group evolved the same way. They went through the same path, a parallel path or parallel trend. So, if I take this difference, which is outcome after for the treated minus the outcome before, this minus that is this length, then you have not only ATT, 
but you also have the effect of the natural change over time that would have happened without the treatment. And we want to get rid of that. If the parallel trends assumption is satisfied, then this variation shows for the control group. And if it shows for the control group, then I can take a difference. So the first difference is ATT plus A for the treatment group and then just A for the control group. The second difference is going to be ATT plus A minus A. The A's will cancel out and what is left is the average treatment on the treated. Any questions? This graph is crucial to understand the concept of difference in differences. Looks clear? Great. I did a good job then because <laughs> uh, to me when I learned it the first time it was not clear at all mostly due to the wording some authors can be very very um, good with words in the sense that they will use a little amount of math and use words instead problem is since English still is not my first language I would get lost in the words and I would have a hard time to follow the whole thought process this picture to me looks fairly clear. Now, the same way we try to estimate the average treatment effect with a regression, we can do the same for the difference in differences estimator. The advantage is that we can throw some x's to reduce the omitted variable bias. In particular, we can include things that changed over time. We can include covariates that varied over time. And second, it will improve the precision of the estimates via a lower residual variance. So let's look at the model. A lot of things here. Beta zero, we know it, the intercept. Tau times di, we know it. It's a coefficient in front of the treatment. Lambda dt is new. dt is a dummy variable for before versus, versus after. Before the treatment, d is equal to 0. After the treatment, d is equal to 1. And then I'm going to include an interaction term delta times di times dt. di times dt is a product of ones and zeros because it's a product of two dummy variables. When is it equal to one? It is equal to one only when di is equal to one and dt is equal to one as well, which means that this variable is equal to one only for treated units after the treatment. Treated units before would also get a zero because dt would be equal to zero. So, and then some covariates here that we can add to the mix. So di is equal to one for the treated, zero for the control, before or after, doesn't matter. dt is a variable for before versus after. So do I look at the outcome before the treatment or after the treatment. So one treated unit and one control unit would both get dt is equal to one if you look at their outcome before the treatment, uh, after the treatment, sorry. In the interaction term is only equal to one for a treated unit after the treatment. Let's break down this regression the same way we did for the average treatment effect. 
if I use the same difference in differences estimator as above, the difference in means, here is what I do. I take the difference in the expectation of the outcome for the treated after and the treated before. Instead of dt, what I had before was big T equal to zero. That's the first difference. That is what gives me ATT plus A. Then I take the second difference, which is the difference in the average outcome for the control group after versus before. This is just A. Now, by taking the difference of those two um, differences, I will be able to abstract from the time component and I will end up with only ATT. Let's look at it using the math. The expectation of Y when DI is equal to 1 and DT is equal to 1, given X, will give you beta 0 plus tau because DI is equal to 1 plus lambda because DT is equal to 1 plus delta because both DI and DT are equal to 1 plus xi prime beta 1. That's the first one here. Beta 0 plus tau plus lambda plus delta plus xi prime beta 1. Then the second difference, <coughs> the second term, sorry, is the treatment group before the treatment happened. So beta 0 plus tau because di is equal to 1. But here, dt is equal to 0. So lambda will be multiplied by 0, so forget about the lambda. And since dt is equal to 0, then this term also disappears. And I have the plus xi prime beta 1. So that gives me beta 0 plus t, uh, plus tau, sorry, plus xi prime beta 1. Now, the third element looks at the control group. Since we look at the control group after, this one will be 0 because we look at the control group. This one will be 1 or lambda because we look at after. And this one will be 0 because di is equal to 0. That's the control group plus xi prime beta 1. So you end up with beta 0 plus lambda plus xi prime beta 1. Finally, the last term is before the treatment for the control group. So di is 0, dt is 0, and di times dt is super 0. And you end up with beta 0 plus xi prime beta 1. And everything else in between is 0. Now, if you take all the differences, note that the beta zeros cancel within each difference. Now, what I want to show you first is that the first difference is going to remove the specific group difference. And the group difference here is tau. It is the fact that in my first difference, I look at the treatment group only. And the difference between just being a treatment versus control, let alone everything else, is due to tau. This is just the fundamental difference between the two groups in the first place. You see that this tau here shows up here as well, but then does not show up because tau is specific to the treatment group, not to the control group. So this tau cancels with this tau. This is why we take the first difference. Of course, xi prime beta 1 also cancels here. Beta 0 also cancels. But note that lambda and delta do not cancel with anybody here. So this first big difference gives you lambda plus delta. Everything else cancels. The second difference is going to be the same as before, but tau is what is inherent to the treatment group 
versus the control group. So the control group just doesn't have tau. They have lambda because lambda is the time component. The same way we have lambda here. And beta 0 and xi prime beta cancel. So now what we are left with is tau plus lambda plus delta in the first difference. And lambda, oh uh, sorry, lambda plus delta in the first difference and lambda in the second difference. Lambda is this common variation that both groups have, which is due to time. This is the parallel trend assumption. Because we assume that both groups evolve the same way over time, in the absence of a treatment, then the lambdas are the same. If the lambdas were, were different, you can see how here, we would not be able to cancel these two lambdas. The second difference is what is going to take, is going to remove the time variation component. The treatment group would have evolved by lambda if it was not treated. The control group evolved by lambda. So here we take the difference so that the lambdas are going to cancel out. This is the same as the A here. It is exactly the same. This is what we're removing. So what are we left with? We are left with lambda plus delta minus lambda. Lambdas cancel out delta. So delta here, this one, is the estimate of the average treatment effect on the treated. If you run this regression, this is the coefficient you will be looking at to get your difference and differences estimates. Same graph as before, but now I am using the notation from the regression. Lambda is the change over time, which I called A in the previous graph. Tau is the original difference between the two groups. They are just fundamentally different. Beta zero is the intercept for both. So being in the treatment group, the treatment group gets beta zero plus tau before the treatment and in the absence of a treatment. Then the treatment happens. For the control group, the change is equal to lambda. This is a time specific change. For the treatment group, not only there is lambda by our parallel trend assumption, but also the effect of the treatment, delta. So remember that what we want is this. How can we get this length? Given that we do not observe this. We know this, we know that, we know this, we know that. So what we are going to do is, we measure this first, lambda plus delta minus lambda. But in a regression, what we need to do is remove the tau component first, and the beta zeros are going to cancel out anyway. They show up four times, here, 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 no problem, they cancel every time. Any questions? If you understand this picture, you understand difference, difference in differences. Difference in differences is <clears throat> very, very, um, uh, very popular and used a lot by economists to look at the impact on some policies that, that were implemented without their um, initiative. And because they did not take the initiative, they could not decide, they could not design the perfect experiment by randomizing who the treatment is going to go to. 
recently. Um, uh, um, a friend of mine who also graduated from SFU looked at the impact on the appearance of school vouchers in 2000 or 2001 in British Columbia on the competition between schools. The idea is that um, kids didn't, were not forced to go to the local um, public school in their catchment area anymore. They could also enroll in other public schools and private schools. So he looked at the impact of this policy on different outcomes regarding to um, the schools in general. That would likely increase competition between schools because now a public school does not necessarily get all the kids that are in, that, uh, in the catchment area. They can get kids from some, some other places and so that would increase competition, that might increase class sizes, enrollment, dropouts, and he looked at the impact of this policy on a bunch of different um, school-related outcomes. In Quebec, not a very long time ago, was implemented a um, childcare subsidy. So they looked at the impact of this childcare subsidy on um, on uh, different outcomes, such as the labor supply of the parents, how much more or less parents worked after and before the, um, the treatment. The subsidy was not targeting people in particular. Everybody suddenly had access to the subsidy, or at least just in Quebec. So what they did was they compare, <clears throat> they compare the situation of parents with kids at childcare in Quebec before and after versus the situation of parents with kid in childcare outside of Quebec. Something like, I don't remember, but maybe Ontario or Nova Scotia. So in practice, there are many natural experiments to observe and take advantage of. Units are different, but one needs to make sure they have parallel paths in the absence of treatment. That is the most important assumption to check in this case. A country or state passes a law, but other states or countries around don't. For instance, healthcare programs like childcare subsidy or access to universal health care, or um, um, other measures related to health outcomes. Immigration laws. Some state might relax uh, the rules on accepting immigrants, whereas other states or the countries might um, strengthen those... Um, might... might um, how can I say this? Limit access um, to immigrants. Minimum wages law. One state, one country might um, set a new minimum wage. And you want to look at the impact of this minimum wage on employment between a state where the minimum wage law was passed and a state where it wasn't. All of these um, situations have in common that the units we are comparing are not ex ante comparable. If I, want to con to, um, if I want to compare the state of Washington in the US and the state of um, Oregon, they are close to each other. One could argue that they are similar, maybe in terms of, um, in terms of voting outcomes, in terms of unemployment in general, and so on. But if you compare, um, you could compare Washington state and other states, which are fundamentally different, where taxes are different, populations are different, and so on. Because they are fundamentally different, you need to take these first differences. COVID-19 related practices. In Europe, some countries um, stated a lockdown for a certain amount of time. Some lockdowns were more strict than others. Some of them had a curfew at 6 p.m. That was the case in France not a long time ago. Others 
didn't have a curfew, but they had more restrictions on um, more restrictions on public gatherings. And this way, you can compare practices of different countries with a treatment, um, and look at the uh, yeah, and look at the um, average outcomes between after and before the treatment. In fact, by now, like right now, this is probably what many papers are doing. Many papers are probably working on estimating difference in differences um, estimators for uh, countries in Europe where laws regarding the lockdowns and COVID-19 related practices were different. And they're going to look at the impact of those different treatments on the number of people in hospitals, the number of uh, people who died from the virus or the number of people who were contaminated. You could do the same for vaccine rollouts. Rollout. Not every country is distributing vaccines the same way. British Columbia, for instance, I only know this for British Columbia, has as a priority, uh, has a priority of providing the first vaccine dose to everybody before proposing a second dose. In other countries, they um, give priority to all the people. And once all the people have both of their doses, then they um, lower the minimum, uh, the minimum age to um, get a vaccine. So those are different practices. And we could look at the impact of uh, these practices on COVID cases and COVID related deaths over time. Now, if there is another source of variation that differs across groups, so another potential confounder, one can differentiate with respect to that confounder. Here we have two confounders. We have the change over time and we have the chain, we have the difference, the, in, the um, inherent difference across groups. We assume that the change over time is the same even though the groups are different. Imagine you have a third source of variation that is specific to the treatment group versus the control group. For instance, something else happened in the meantime, not just the treatment. But maybe one, um, uh, maybe one state had another law that was passed and the other state didn't. That could be another potential confounder that would bias your estimates of the treatment. So in this case, you can use a diff in diff in diffs, a triple difference estimator. You take first difference between um, after and before, after and before, that's for treated, that's for control. Then you could take another difference inside that is due to their own uh, um, specific variations. And then finally, you take the, the difference of these two differences to get a diff and diff and diff estimator. You can see how you can quickly get out of hand by adding more sources of variations over time, which are different across groups. And of course, you will need to make additional parallel trend assumptions. Okay, um, let's go over regression discontinuity designs and yeah, sorry, let's go over that. Is everybody ready? Any questions before I move on? Okay. Now, regression discontinuity designs are a bit different from the first um, two type of estimators we saw. Because here, X is directly identified as a confounder. 
Here, in fact, x is going to determine the treatment directly. So consider a variable x that determines whether someone will receive a treatment or not at a cutoff point. So once x is beyond a cutoff point c0, boom, the unit with an x which is bigger than c0 gets treated. Such a variable is called a running variable, as if x was running, and once it is past the c0 threshold, then our individual gets treated. Since x determines treatment, obviously it is a confounder. We will not get away with the two previous estimators. And if you compare treatment and control group, you will have a biased estimation. You're going to have a selection bias. Some, some of them got treated because their x was good enough, big enough. The others didn't. For instance, a GPA cutoff of 3.5 to receive a scholarship. Those above 3.5 would do better than 2.5 even without a scholarship. They are inherently different. If they had such a difference in GPA in the first place, let alone scholarships, then the students are hardly comparable. The difference is too big. So if you compare those students to look at the impact of a scholarship, the impact of the scholarship, its estimation, will be biased. Some of this effect will include the fact that maybe the students with 3.5 are simply just, I don't want to say smarter, but yeah, they're just better at school than the ones at 2.5. Now, what about comparing the ones at 3.4 who are not getting the scholarship because it's not 3.5 versus the ones at 3.6, the ones who actually get the scholarship. The difference here is pretty subtle. In fact, at this stage, the difference could be due to random luck. You maybe didn't get lucky in a course where you thought you would get A plus or A and you got B plus instead. Your GPA would be slightly lower than somebody else who got the A instead of the B+. Plus. So other than this, maybe those two units are comparable. And because we are comparing individuals which are close in terms of their x, we are talking about estimating a local average treatment effect. I will not use students who got 2.5 in their GPA to look at the impact of a scholarship that is awarded for a GPA of 3.5 minimum. We need to make a crucial assumption. Every method, every design comes with one very crucial assumption. Again, potential outcomes. The potential outcome of an individual whose x is equal to c0 if it if it was not treated is the same as the expected outcome no it's not the same sorry uh, is a continuous function of xi as well as the expected outcome of an individual at the threshold had he been treated it's not an equality of expectations here is that each of them is a continuous function of x, in particular when x is equal to c0. Every time you are thinking about continuous in terms of functions, you should be thinking about no jumps. The function is not like boop, suddenly jumping up or jumping down. The assumption, as it, as it looks, as it is, is um, kind of confusing or kind of cryptic, abstract. But if you put words on it, it's way easier to understand. At xi is equal to c0, the average potential outcomes do not jump. That means that if they do jump, 
then it means there is something else than the policy, something else than crossing the threshold that creates an impact. When we are at x is equal xi is equal to c0, for somebody who is not treated, his average outcome would be continuous if it never had been treated. Let's say he misses the application to get a scholarship, although he has the GPA to do it, to get it. So he will not be treated. We assume this expectation is continuous. Same for the one who um, got treated. Imagine he would have been treated luckily with a GPA of 3.4. Then we assume that no matter what, his average outcome, had he been treated all the way, would not jump. So here, I'm looking at somebody who's never treated, before or after the cutoff, and somebody who would have been treated before or after the cutoff. The idea is that if their treatment status doesn't change, then the average outcome is continuous. The only thing that can make the average outcome jump is the treatment. The idea is that if we don't, if there is a jump due to something else, then we will not be able to capture that and our estimation will be biased. Did this person outcome suddenly change because he got access to the scholarship? Or because of another reason. If there is another reason, then our estimation will not be reliable. And again, we cannot directly test that assumption, but knowledge of the circumstances around the treatment can help build the case. If you know that nothing else, it changes around the, um, the provision of the scholarship, then you can reasonably assume, or make a case at least, that if there is a jump, it is only due to the scholarship. And if it is only due to the scholarship, then we're good, we can proceed. So, it is then relevant to consider the observations close to the cutoff point. Observations just below the threshold, the control group, can constitute a good counterfactual for the ones above the threshold. If somebody at 3.4 of a GPA is comparable to some, somebody at 3.6, then the person at 3.4 is a good representation of what would have happened if the 3.6 GPA student did not get the scholarship. So we compare people just above and just below the threshold because they are comparable. They are a good counterfactual for each other if the assumptions are satisfied. So what do we do then? Well, if there is a jump as soon as somebody gets the scholarship or gets the treatment, then what we can do is look at the average outcome of somebody at the threshold but coming from below the threshold, as in somebody at 3.5, but for some reason not getting the scholarship, and somebody at exactly 3.5 who got the scholarship. So you can estimate two separate regression lines on each side of the cutoff. To build a prediction at the cutoff, you get the prediction from above, from below the threshold, and the prediction from above the threshold and you take the difference. So the estimate of the, the latte, tau hat latte, will be y hat plus minus y hat minus, where y hat plus is the prediction at x zero, at x is equal to c zero from the right regression using all the observations who got the treatment, and y hat minus is the prediction at xi is equal to zero from the left, using all the observations who did not get the scholarship, the treatment.
Again, the best is to use a picture. This is the kind of picture you would expect to see if there is the effect of a policy on, um, on, some, on some outcome. Imagine we have a variable x, where once x crosses a threshold of 50, any individual with a higher x than 50 becomes a treated individual. So all the blue points on the right correspond to the treatment group, and all the points, on the red points on the left correspond to the control group. If you observe such a pattern in the data, then chances are that indeed crossing the threshold means jumping. And the jump is precisely what we want to estimate at the threshold, which is why we say it's local. We look at it at the threshold, not any, anywhere else. So estimate a regression line on the left, estimate a regression line on the right, and look at the prediction of each when x is exactly equal to 50. There you go. You run two separate regressions. Or you can put them at once by including a term, uh, by including a variable that is equal to 1 if x is bigger than 50 or 0 otherwise. Note that even the slope can change. This slope is not the same as this slope. It could be that once a unit crosses a threshold and gets treated, its evolution with x will be different than the evolution for units below the threshold. What matters though is to look at this point and this point. Very visual, fairly easy. You just have to control for the set of rules that determines the cutoff. You have to make sure in particular that the cutoff cannot be manipulated. You also need to make sure um, of one or two other conditions which are related to the context of the um, assignment rule. But you could do the same for many other um, running variables. There has been some studies on the impact of crossing the age um, of drinking alcohol on um, driving behavior, for instance. As soon as you get 21 years old in the US, you can drink, and do we see a change in alcohol patterns or in driving patterns and so on? That's something that RDD can answer. Any policy in general that acts as you cross the threshold, you are eligible for the policy. Any of these, any question related to the estimation of these effects can be answered via regression discontinuity designs. There could be something like um, as soon as you are 60 or 65, then you get access to um, the elderly um, discounts for the bus. So we could look at the impact of such a discount, such a rule, on, um, <clears throat> on commute behaviors. Does somebody who's 66 take the bus more than somebody who is 64? Somebody who's 66 benefits from discounts, whereas somebody who's 64 doesn't. Many policies are, in fact, designed this way. You have to meet a certain requirement after which you are eligible to a certain treatment. I'm sure you can think of many. There are some of them related to healthcare, some of them related to laws in general, and you can estimate the impact of these, um, of these laws on some outcomes. If there is no impact, then there is no jump. Then the blue line would be connected to uh, the red line somewhere, somehow. The slope could change, but at least the effect itself might not change. 
there might not be an actual effect of crossing the threshold. But once you cross it, there could be a different path for you, a different slope. And note that here I fitted a linear regression on both sides, but we've seen that if we care about predicting only, which we only care about here, we want to predict this point and this point, then we could use more flexible models. So why use a linear regression only? We could add flexibility to our regressions in order to improve predictive power. For instance, polynomial estimators. This is something we've done um, in the previous lectures. You can include x2, x3, and multiple other polynomials of x to add curvature. If you only have x2, you're going to have a parabola. If you have x3, you're going to have some kind of an s. If you have x4, you can have more s's. And the more terms you add, the more curvature you can get. You can also use non-parametric estimators. They offer more flexibility. It is a fascinating topic, at least to me. This is one of my favorite topics. Unfortunately, I will not talk a lot about it, or maybe not at all, in this course. But among other estimators, we have kernel estimators. If you remember the lecture on model selection, that's the estimator I used when I said very flexible estimator to talk about overfitting and the um, training MSC and the test MSC. Splines. Splines are piecewise polynomials. They are very interesting as well. They consist in uh, making a polynomial on one interval and on another interval make another polynomial. So the function could look curved on one hand and then just slightly linear, then super curved again, and so on, depending on each interval, how the data behaves. Nearest neighbors estimators is something our estimators we haven't seen in this course. You can take a look at it in ISLR. Um, it consists in looking at the nearest observations. If you want to predict a certain Y, look at all the Ys that are around and compute some sort of a um, weighted average. Observations which are closer to you will get a higher weight, and observations which are further away will get less weight because they don't matter as much. Here is an example. Imagine we have this regression discontinuity design, where here it looks like there is some curvature, it looks like the pattern is not linear. And here, not sure, but towards the end, it seems that um, the observations tend to shoot off. I could fit linear regressions, and this is what I get. My estimated effect would be something around 200 and, I'd say, 10 minus 90. If I add curvature instead, and different curvatures, see here, I have a, it's not just a square, then my effect on the left is equal, my prediction on the left is equal to 110, and on the right equal to 210-ish or 20. The effect is going to be different again. One more thing we need to take into account is observations around the cutoff matter more than observations far away from it, right? After all, we, we said that we are not going to compare somebody with a GPA of 3.8 or 3.9 with somebody with a GPA of 2. Those people are just not comparable, scholarship or not. So, we can also consider weighting observations close to the cutoff, weighting them more, than the observations outside of the cutoff. In fact, many estimators regress an OLS like I did, but they don't regress an OLS using all of the data here. Rather, they would find an optimal window to cut the observations. And they say, for instance, I'm going to estimate my regression 
only based uh, only based on um, on observations between 10 and 20. Because those ones are close to the cutoff, those ones are comparable, but as I get further away, they are less and less relevant. We call this local least squares or local linear least squares. You give a weight, you give a different weight to different observations depending on where they are located. Any questions? Okay. One last thing I want to mention about RDD is the fact that so far we considered an RD design called sharp RDD. Sharp RDD means the treatment goes from 0 to 1 as soon as the threshold is crossed. You get a GP of 3.5, boom, you get a scholarship. But there is another type of RDD called fuzzy RDD. Fuzzy RDD corresponds to a jump in the probability of getting treated. But it doesn't jump all the way from 0 to 1. It jumps from maybe 0 to 50%. So not everybody above the threshold is going to get treated. For instance, imagine a case where the university has a limited amount of scholarships that they are going to allocate randomly to students with a GPA above 3.5. Then getting a GPA of 3.5 is not enough to get a scholarship. It is just enough to enter the lottery. And then you might get it or you might not. This is what we call fuzzy RDD. We still need assumptions one, to one and four to be satisfied, same as before, the continuity assumptions, but the estimation is going to change. In fact, so latte can be estimated via two stage least squares. I hope you remember lecture two. So let zi be a dummy variable equal to one if xi is bigger than c0 and zero otherwise. Note that I call it z the same way I call instruments z. Z here will act as an instrument. It is not a perfect predictor of whether somebody is going to get treated once they cross the threshold because it's equal to one if somebody crosses the threshold but that person might not be treated either that person only has some probability of being treated and because that is an instrument we are going to use z to predict the probability of being treated so the first stage is to regress di, the treatment, on zi and on some combination of xi, like polynomials. Once you do this, as per the two SLS procedure, you get the estimated or the prediction, the predictions of the probability of getting treated d hat i d hat is not between zero is, is not zero or one it is in between then in the second stage you're going to include d hat in an OLS that regresses y i on d hat i and the x's note that it is important to recenter the x's around c0 so you do not put x i x i period you put x i minus c0 in your um, regression. The effect, the estimated coefficient associated to d hat will be the estimate of tau latte. So 
Some of you will go over this in your papers. So there are different ways to do it. Two stage least squares is typically one way. There are also two other ways, which are relatively similar that you can take a look at the book in the book. But um, since I want to relate to something we've done in the previous lectures, I will show you the two SLS um, version of the estimator. Any questions about RDD before I move on to the last estimator? Okay. I won't be long on the last estimator, which is why I decided not to have a second break today. The last type of estimator is called synthetic control. So what have we done so far? So far, we have compared the average outcome between treatment and control groups, hoping or knowing thanks to the assumptions made, that the control group can constitute a good counterfactual for the treatment group, that the control group somehow reflects how the outcome would have been for the, treat the treatment group units had they not been treated. What if we don't have a plausible counterfactual? We don't really have a unit to compare the treatment group to. Abadi and Gardea Sabal in 2003 studied the impact of terrorism in the Basque country, that's home, on economic activity. So to give you a bit of background, the Basque country is shared between the French side and the Spanish side. The Spanish side have been more vocal in the past about becoming independent, becoming their own country. We Basque people have our own language, we have our own culture, our own traditions, which are very different from French traditions and Spanish traditions. I grew up with both, French traditions and Basque traditions. We have Basque immersion, the same way in Vancouver there is French immersion schools. My niece, for instance, and my nephew go to a school where they only speak in Basque. They're going to take the national exam in Basque. It will be the same topic, same, same uh, questions as French people, French students, but they will have to answer in Basque. Because of these um, cultural differences, the Basque, in particular um, in Spain, have been very vocal in uh, wanting to become independent, wanting to become their own country. And in the 1980s, they became pretty violent towards the Spanish government, in particular the Spanish side, where they um, started some terrorism attacks, like uh, bombing real estate agencies which are not Basque, for instance. They will bomb them overnight not during the day. So they would not kill anybody, but they would call and say, don't go to the office tomorrow, there is a bomb. We, would, we don't want you um, in the Basque country anymore, or just we don't want you there. They would kidnap some, um, some people. I don't remember if they would do it for ransom or just for political leverage. And there have been some shooting in the past. They would hide weapons in the mountains. Um, the Basque Country is pretty much in the middle of the Pyrenees, which is a chain of mountains that separates France and Spain. So Abadi, which is uh, from the Basque Country but the Spanish side, studied the impact of terrorism in the Basque Country on economic activity. So terrorism acts as a treatment, but there is no counterfactual Basque Country for which no terrorism happened. 
Now, you might think, yeah, but we can do this for diff and diff. Because in diff and diff, units, groups, are not the same ex ante anyway. So the Basque Country is not the same as the neighboring region of, um, of like, um, Catalonia or um, Andalusia and so on. The idea is that here, we don't really have a big control group. We only have a couple of provinces. And we have one treated unit. So using diff and diff will not yield very precise estimates. It's like running a regression with 10 observations. So what I did is to create a synthetic Basque country, which is a Basque country without terrorism by computing a combination of other regions of Spain that resembles the Basque country before terrorism and compared the two units. So since they were not very confident about comparing just regions, like regions where terrorism didn't happen and the Basque country, they created a counterfactual Basque country that imitates the trends of the Basque country before the treatment. So the idea is to choose a set of weights on the control units. Control units are um, regions of Spain, such that the resulting synthetic units are close to the characteristics of the treated units in the pre-treatment period. In the post-treatment period, well, the Basque country is treated. There was terrorism, so we can observe it. How do we, how do we find the synthetic unit? Well, we compute the synthetic outcome as the combination of the control unit's outcomes. But since the weights have been chosen to look like the Basque country before treatment, then this post-treatment synthetic unit will be a representation of what would have happened to the Basque country without terrorism. Then each treated unit, imagine you have more treated units, has its own synthetic unit. The Basque country would have a synthetic Basque country. Another region would have their own synthetic region. And so you can take the difference between the two and that gives you an estimate of the average treatment on the treated, the average treatment on the Basque country. It is very powerful when only few units are treated, like a country, state or province who passes a law. Synthetic control can produce a better counterfactual for a treated unit than the control units. After all, the Basque Country can hardly be compared to any other region of Spain due to the big cultural differences. Even parallel trends would have been difficult to, um, difficult to satisfy. Parallel trends would have been how the Basque Country would have evolved if terrorism had not happened. Can we be sure that the Basque Country would have evolved the same way, using, following the same path as Andalusia, uh, Murcia, Asturias, and so on? So, let's go through the model and the simplified procedure. The notation again is pretty heavy, so bear with me, we are almost there. Let yt be the outcome variable at time t. Time is not only one or zero, it starts at time equal to one and goes over multiple periods. Now, I'm gonna make a distinction between the treated units and the control units. Every time I put i somewhere, I am considering a treated unit, the Basque country. Every time I see a j, I will look at a control unit, a unit other than the Basque Country. 
The treatment happens at some time t0 in between 1 and big T. So all the periods before t0 are pre-treatment, and all the periods after are post-treatment. This is a generalization of the two periods diff-and-diff diff case. But when you look at difference and differences, you can also have more than just two periods. So, for a treated unit, we are interested in the value alpha i t for t bigger than t0. So, alpha i, it will be the effect of the treatment on unit i, which is one of the treated units, for any time period after the treatment happened. Imagine, for instance, that um, terrorism lasted five years. Then, after these five years, we would be looking at, or during the five years, let's say after the first year, sorry, we would be looking at the um, effect of the treatment several periods after terrorism started. Now, let xi be the vector of k covariates that are unaffected by the treatment for unit i. So unit i is treated, and let x be a vector of covariates that are unaffected by the treatment. Now let x0 be the matrix of covariates gathering all the control unit vectors xj. Since here we have one treated unit and multiple um, control units, then x0 is going to be a matrix, but xit will be a vector. Now, let w be the vector of weights of the size of the control units, one weight per control unit. So each treated unit is going to have its own synthetic unit. But to build this synthetic unit, we need to find the weights optimally. But for each treated unit, a different set of weights will be optimal. So each treated unit will have a synthetic unit with a different set of weights. How do we find the optimal weights? If you want to find the optimal weights, you want to minimize the distance between unit i's covariates, the x's, and the synthetic ones. The synthetic ones are the combination of all the treated, all the control units after being reweighted. So x0w or x0wi will be the synthetic Basque country. We want W to be chosen so that this synthetic Basque country is as close as possible to the original Basque country before terrorism happened. We are creating a counterfactual Basque country where before terrorism they are going the same way. Parallel trends. Then after, well, the real Basque country got terrorism, so something happened to it, and the other one followed its path, because nothing happened. Note that those two bars here denote what we call a norm. I do not want to get into this in this class. A norm is the same as a distance, okay? So when we looked at the OLS estimator as an estimator that minimizes a distance, we, I could have said as well that it minimizes a norm. Now, because we are looking at weights, we have to make sure that the weights sum up to 1, and they are either positive or 0. A weight bigger than 1 or smaller than 0 doesn't make sense. And the weights should add up to 1. Now, once this problem is solved, 
R will do it for you. There's actually a package that the author that the authors made. You get your WI star vector, your optimal weights. And so what you want to do is compare after the treatment happened. You want to compare the outcome in the Basque country, YIT, and the synthetic Basque country. The synthetic Basque country will be a combination of all the control units, which is why I have J here. This is a combination of all the outcomes in the control units weighted by the WIJ. So at time T, let's say one year after terrorism started in the Basque country, the estimate of the average treatment effect on the treated will be the outcome in the Basque country minus this fake outcome, which was created to look like the Basque country before the treatment. So this will be a counterfactual of the Basque country in the absence of a treatment. Among other variables, I believe that the Ys that uh, the authors looked at was where um, GDP, unemployment, I believe they also looked at um, they looked at other aggregates. I forgot which ones. Economic aggregates. Good. The good thing though is, one of you is gonna have to read this paper. One of you is gonna have to describe the results to me, and uh, I am waiting for this with impatience. So uh, make sure you understand what's going on. This is the general idea. The notation will get more cumbersome in the paper because it general. There are multiple generalizations of this method. And I believe that they, they're, um, what they show is a way more um, complex method. The idea is the same though. So whoever is reading this paper, do not worry with the technical details, but I will still ask you to re-explain what the authors are doing using the notation of the paper. All of you guys are gonna have to do, to do this. And then you'll have to explain what the results are, what the background checks are, what the data are, and so on and so forth. Any questions? By the way, synthetic control methods are a generalization of difference in differences. Here we don't really have parallel trend assumption. So we create this fake Basque country that is going to satisfy parallel trend assumption so we can estimate the average treatment on the treated. And then you can do this for each treated unit. So if there was another unit who was subject to the same treatment, you would solve the same problem but that other unit would have its own vector of weights. It is powerful in the sense that we can get to a consistent and reliable estimation of the average treatment effect on the treated using a fake um, observation. We created this fake observation, but we created it in an, in an educated way to satisfy the assumptions needed for this estimation to be reliable. Okay, I'm going to conclude the lecture here. So, treatment effects overall, what are the takeaways? The literature on treatment effects is vast. It is not very recent but it is definitely very trendy among economists because you just need to get a good idea, find a good um, program, design a good pilot program, run the trial, and then get to the um, data analysis. There are different experimental designs. We talked about pure experiments, like giving a drug to a patient and giving a placebo to another. 
that's if we are in full control of um, the experimental design. We can make, we can create randomized control trials. We have different assumptions. If it's not possible to design a whole experiment, we can use natural experiments that occurred in uh, real life at some point. For this, we need a whole other set of assumptions. I mentioned parallel trends for difference, difference and differences. I mentioned uh, continuity for regression discontinuity designs, RDD. There are different ways to handle standard errors. After all, since we are comparing groups, we need to make sure that the standard errors are, um, are correctly estimated if we want to make any hypothesis tests. You might encounter words such as clustering. Clustered standard errors is something that almost all of you will see in your papers. Bootstrapping, which is a lovely concept. I don't know if, we'll, if I will have time to talk about it, but definitely next week in uh, machine learning, I will um, talk about it a bit. There are methods like randomize, um, randomization inference as well that are used to um, increase the reliability of standard errors. Program evaluation methods are implemented by many organizations and governments. You could be working with doctors to design the experiments to test the effect of drugs or living conditions on health outcomes. You could be hired as an economist to work in a hospital. You could work with health authorities in general, Vancouver Coastal Health, um, Fraser Health. They might give you access to a lot of data regarding, well, right now, regarding COVID cases, hospitalization cases. They could give you data on uh, capacity of hospitals and how this impacts maybe uh, deaths coming from that hospital. Those methods are used a lot in education as well, immigration as well, um, environmental economics as well. So if you have a rough idea of how those concepts work, you will get a job anywhere, as long as you can manipulate the data coming from the experiments. The choice of one method over another depends on the experimental designs, what assumptions are satisfied, and that will tell you what is the appropriate estimated use. And at the end of the day, we want to predict the effect of a policy on an outcome variable. We want to estimate expectation of Y given a treatment or given some covariates X. So since we want to predict machine learning, there is room for machine learning algorithms. And recently, there have been many, um, there have been a lot of research and a lot of improvements in using machine learning algorithms to um, estimate average treatment effects. This is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about treatment effects today. So I can make a couple of um, comments and maybe a segue um, next week once we talk about machine learning algorithms. Program evaluation methods are the kind of methods that will allow you to make a big difference as an economist. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Spotify, Wayfair are firms I talked to in a conference in 2019 now, two years ago, um, that all told me that one of the main tools to know if you want to work for them is program evaluation methods. Reason is, well, Amazon is constantly trying to change the way the website looks like. You know, all these other people click on this, oh, uh, also look at that, oh, include this as a package, and so on and so forth. Amazon is constantly trying to, um, well, to improve the customer's experience. That's what they say. In my mind, what it means is trying to make you click and buy more, spend more time on Amazon. By making the website more comfortable to browse, you are more likely to put more things in your cart, which is just in itself, even if you don't purchase, is already giving away data.
and they use this data to predict or make better suggestions to other customers who looked at similar product. On a regular basis, they will select a random uh, pool of, um, of customers with an account on Amazon and they will change the way the Amazon um, website looks like to them. This is a randomized control trial. They are going to change the way the, look, the, the page looks for some of them and not the others. If your, uh, if your experience on Amazon doesn't change, if the website still looks the same, you are part of the control group, pretty much. And they look at the difference in the number, uh, the number of clicks per page, the amount of time you spend per page, uh, the probability of buying between before and after, and so on and so forth. All of these, um, all of these, um, designs call for the use of program evaluation methods. Microsoft does A-B testing on a regular basis. They do the same thing. They might change the customer's interface um, of some of the products and look at the difference in the experience, look at how much time um, users spent on that different interface, if the experience was different, and so on and so forth. So I strongly suggest you to um, invest some time in understanding these methods. You're going, you're going to need this. You are going to need this anyway for the papers you're going to have to read and present, and probably the papers you're going to have to write. And that's it for this lecture on program evaluation methods or causal inference. Have a good rest of your week, and see you in the next one. Bye.